Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joe Stobb, Generation You Can. Thank you for joining us on this Sunday. It was a little bit of a short notice event. Obviously, we have two important people here who have tough schedules, one uh, in the college world, one in the NBA world. So to kind of find time to mesh them together and get both of them here at the same time was obviously, you know, we had, we had to do it when we could. So apologize if uh, some of you guys weren't able to make it live and you're catching this recorded. Also, there's obviously a big football game on right now. So if you catch myself, Chris, Josh, kind of staring up, looking off to the screen, it's not because we have a ton of people in our house. It's because we're probably trying to peek, uh, peek at the screen and see what's cooking in the Pats game right now. So you know who I am. You know what I'm here to do. Uh, let's introduce our two panelists today. Josh Bonhodel. Did I say that right? Bonatol. Bonatol. Sorry, buddy. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's the best. I'm a strange coach by trade, man. I, uh, I'm not Jay Billis here. My notes are on a phone. It's about three <laughs> sentences long. My prep, my prep, interview prep is not – I got to work on it. It's not on point. Um, he is the Purdue men's basketball strain coach, currently 19-2, and two, third best team in the NCAA per rankings. We also have Chris Chase, Memphis Grizzlies, and I'm going to get this wrong in the coordination of your cool title – so is it developmental strength and conditioning coach or strength and conditioning developmental coach? Uh, what's on the business card is strength and conditioning development coordinator. Ah, very nice. See, this is with all the fancy technicalities and stuff. Man, um, you could have a full podcast about the new titles in the NBA, like playing the title game in the NBA. It's, it's pretty absurd right now. The list, like what people are coming up with is pretty nuts. But um, I, guess, I guess we feel pressure to do that for some reason. I, I hear you. It's, it, when I left the college game, it was starting to get like that. And Josh, I'm sure you can agree. I'm sure you have a few people who you know in that college world who have some funky titles. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no. Nice. All right. So let's give everyone um, just a quick elevator pitch background on each of you guys. Uh, whoever wants to start, take it away. Uh, Josh, go ahead. Yeah. So I am in my seventh season now, uh, director of sports performance for men's basketball at Purdue. Um, prior to that, I spent a total of four seasons with the Chicago Bulls. Um, three of those years, I was the assistant strength coach. And my first year was kind of my, my way to break into that world. Um, I, was in, I was an intern for a season. Um, and that was right out of college. So for me, and I'm sure, you know, Chris probably has a very similar uh, path. But for me, it was one where as soon as I had sort of figured out I wasn't going to play basketball in the NBA, um, I had to find another way in. So all throughout college, uh, really just seeking out every opportunity that I could to learn and get around people that, you know, knew more than I did, uh, which really was everyone at the time. Um, so you seek out those opportunities wherever you can. And I was fortunate to do a handful of internships and, and things like that, which led to ultimately an internship with the Bulls, um, but been fortunate to be mentored by um, some very high-level people, um, Eric Helland and Albert Meal with the Bulls, um, worked for Mike Boyle for a year, so he poured a ton into me, um, so just kind of, I think that's a lot of what's shaped my experiences and, and got me to where I am now. Nice, Chris? Uh, yeah, I mean, similar story to I think a lot of folks that get into strength and conditioning is, you know, I was where I met you, Joe, at, at UConn, and, and I figured it out then uh, after diving into a couple different majors. Um, you know, I was a pharmacy major. I was an education major. And then I finally figured out what exercise science was and it was actually actually a thing. And I didn't I didn't even know what a strength coach was. So. You know, I like to bring that up because it's like, man, I, you know, I, I dove in with with little or no knowledge of what I was getting into. And I was uh, pretty lucky that it happened to be at UConn and, and we had this great kinesiology and exercise science program and people like Bill Kramer and, and Jeff Folick and Carl Marish and all these guys that are that are well known uh, as far as, you know, uh, in the in the science side or the research side of, of, of exercise science and strength and conditioning. So. I got lucky and, uh, you know, I was I was interning with athletes like like you, Joe, in, in, in track and field and, and Olympic sports and mainly football, spending the most time. Uh, and then I had an internship in minor league baseball. I went to grad school at Springfield College in Massachusetts. 
Um, I was a uh, grad assistant my second year for football. And let's see, I had football, field hockey, men's basketball. And uh, Springfield, I've said it before, they provide a really unique, cool experience for you to be a coach, uh, essentially like a head strength coach while you're a grad student. And you can really just experiment and, and apply the things that you're learning. Um, and, and that's really cool. And, and the internships I did at Springfield were at UCLA with UCLA football and then USC football. So I was kind of, and I'm sure we'll touch on this a little bit more, um, but it, because it's shaped my philosophy and then my mindset today, is I was kind of shoved into the world of football and have so much respect for it, but I'm so glad I had a taste of that, but I'm so glad I'm out of it, <laughs> you know? So, um, so that was a cool learning experience, but I, I was thankful that the minor league baseball internship kind of gave me a taste of Olympic sports. And then being out in California and interning at UCLA and USC, Olympic sports are so huge out there. And like there's I, being at UConn, not that they weren't, but like water polo and golf and, uh, you know, track and field as well. Just being at such a high level, baseball at a high level. I was like, man, this is, it was fun being a strength coach on the Olympic side of things. You get such a variety of athletes. So uh, I was, uh, I then got a job at University of Rhode Island. I worked there for a year as an assistant strength coach, having seven teams and that whole gambit of things of only having like two and a half strength coaches and just like, just trying to stay afloat. Uh, I was at USC after that, USC for three years, um, catering to Olympic sports, uh, uh, women's sand volleyball, men's women's track and field, uh, baseball, men's tennis. And then lucky enough to get a, a job with the Atlanta Hawks. Uh, for the past two years, I've been with the Atlanta Hawks as the head strength coach. And then this past year, um, I started with the Memphis Grizzlies. Very nice. Very nice. So obviously similarities, but differences. You know, Josh, you were more straight into kind of the pro side and then obviously made the jump to the college, whereas Chris kind of slowly navigated through all those different layers of the college to get to pro. So how did you two connect? How did you two find each other? How am I here with the two of you today? <laughs> uh, credit think, to Art Horn. Man. Yeah, it was Art Horn. I think Art Horn yeah. is, is a great, uh, great connector. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were in uh, we were in Indy um, playing the Pacers, and Art said like we were actually we were shopping for a timing system, or we were trying to figure out what one we were gonna get, and that that's how Art brought you up. Yeah. Was hey, Josh has this, you know, with the Swift timing system and all this sort of stuff, and uh, we connected at the hotel. That was the first time I, I met Josh. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool, cool. Couple big things in there just for people who are unfamiliar. Art Horn is now with the Boston Celtics, previously the Atlanta Hawks, and previously Northeastern University for a long time. Uh, has married a lot of different things in the sports med, prehab, rehab, training side. Great guy, know him personally myself from my time in the CAA at Hofstra, competing against Northeastern and just um, who he is in that area of the country from a strength and conditioning standpoint. So if you're not familiar with the name, definitely someone to learn from. Uh, sure. And then the Swift Timing System. Actually met those guys the other day in Charlotte. So shout out to Swift Timing. You got good people. Um, so not a bad timing system either, right? <laughs> Absolutely. You're in that free pub right now. Yeah, yeah. man. Hey, got to give everyone a little love. I mean, uh, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the people who helped me. And I know you guys feel the same way, you know, talking know to you that. each. You know, so always got to give respect and shout outs to the people who uh, did it the right way and helped you along the way. For sure. For sure. So moving into the next thing, and this is where I'm going to kind of step back and let you guys go back and forth. Having had time, each of you in the college world, having had time in the professional side, basketball specific, if there's anything in your other experiences that you're going to draw in, please make a reference to it. But what is the same and what is different with dealing with basketball athletes in those two settings I think the big Get thing that up, yeah I think I think the big thing but you know this really goes with any athlete in, in general what is the same is you're dialing it down to the individual and then that's where everything uh, exists that is different um, so you know I think you get a lot of those questions like Chris for you especially coming off of that big football background I think one of the things, you know, people uh, allude to within training an athlete, whether it be a basketball athlete or an Olympic sport athlete, is, is you hear this notion of, oh, well, you know, we, we don't want to train them like a football player. And it's sort of, well, what does that mean? Because 
even as a football player, we are trying to diagnose um, where are they starting from? You know, where, where have they come from and, and where are we starting at with them? So um, really being able to dial down what their strengths and limitations are, how can we get them moving better, how can we make them better athletes, how, we, how can we make them sort of more resilient um, to, to handle loads and, and endure uh, the stresses of, of competition and practice and be able to, um, you know, in our case in basketball, be out on the court more because how they're going to get better at their sport is by putting in more time. Um, but do they have the physical ability? Do they have the physical capacities to do that? Um, so I, I think that's the first thing that we got to look at is, you know, the, the demands of the sport as well as the, uh, the position group. That's only part of the picture of who that individual is and what they need. Um, so that's, that's one of the things I always look at, you know, especially with our guys. Um, I, I think some of the differences that you see, you know, I know for me, um, coming from the Bulls into the college environment at Purdue, um, and also, you know, you, you're not just coming from any NBA franchise, you're coming from Chicago Bulls, you know, it's uh, maybe the most widely known uh, franchise across the world because of Michael Jordan and what they did in the 90s, those six championships. So I'm walking into a college environment where um, in my last season in Chicago, we had the best record in the NBA. Derrick Rose is the MVP of the league, um, and we end up losing it in the conference finals to uh, LeBron and, and Dwayne Wade and those guys in Miami. So I thought walking in naively, you know, these guys at the college level are going to hang on every word I say. You know, they're going to do anything that I ask them to do. Um, because I've been there because, they, you know, they want to be a pro. But I think one of the things you find very quickly is there's a reason guys are in the NBA. You know, the, the, the habits that they've built up, and, and especially I'm talking about not just guys that, you know, a guy might get drafted on their talent. They might, you know, have a rookie contract. But do they get to a second, a third, a fourth contract? The guys that, and, and you know, Chris can attest to this, the guys that spend 10 plus years in the NBA or in professional sports in general, I mean, that is an accomplishment. And that happens because those guys are consistent with their habits. They control what they can control. Um, and their approach is essentially the same every day. They never get too high. They never get too low. Um, and they're always kind of focusing internally. They're always looking at, you know, it's not, oh, well, you know, uh, coaches is, is against me or you know this or that it's what can I do to improve I'm struggling here uh, you know maybe my, my shots not falling okay I got to go back and, and watch tape and see maybe am I taking shots out of rhythm you know what am I doing my, my uh, I've, I've been very fatigued I'm sore I'm this I'm that well what am I doing in terms of recovery I, I found those guys really focus internally and their habits are very well developed at, at the college level um, you know, a lot of guys, they just haven't been exposed to that yet. They've been the best athlete on their team their whole life um, and maybe even the best, you know, basketball player in their state. You know, we got guys coming in who are, you know, a Mr. Basketball type of, type of guy. So they've been able to get by um, with, with poor habits. So I think that's, that's part of it that you see is you see a lot of talented guys at the college level um, where, where you kind of, you wonder why it is that this guy never really sort of made it, so to speak, at the professional level. But, you know, it's hard. It's, there's a lot of sacrifice and, and a lot of discipline uh, that goes into being one of those guys. You're talking about the top 1% of the top 1%. So. Yeah, yeah Chris, yeah. I for sure. Uh, you know, it's, it's, um, there's, there are differences there. I think, um, you know, there, you know, I, I love what Josh touched on in the beginning at the end of the day, man, this is, if you take an athlete centered approach and just, this is a person, I am a problem solver as a strength coach. Like I, I have somebody in front of me who has certain goals, certain aspirations, and they, they happen to play a particular sport, you know, it, they happen to play football or golf or basketball or whatever. 
And, you know, they're, they're, if I am considering that, then when I was a football coach or uh, a football strength and conditioning coach or interning in that environment or whatever, you know, I, I think that was lost a little bit because, man, you know, Joe, you know, uh, Josh, you've been in these weight rooms too. You're just looking down the line and it's, it's McDonald's strength and conditioning, man. It's just like carbon copy, like assembly line sort of stuff. And it's getting better in that world. And that's not a criticism there. It's just hard. That's 70 something, 50 dudes yeah. or whatever that you have to cater to. It's just different. And thankfully getting the perspective of other sports and, you know, it, all of a sudden I'm throwing a women's tennis team. You know, what, what do I have for them? And I learned quickly, okay, I can't just plug and play like I was being a football strength coach, you know, Hey, what is, what are your goals? What are your limitations? What assessments have we done? What's going to be worthwhile for you in this short amount of time that I have you under my wing in college? It's, you know, that maybe you have the, the one and dones in basketball. So you only have one year, maybe you have four, uh, but four years isn't even a long time. So, you know, do you have like, Hey, at the end of the day, what do we want to get out of, of my expertise is strength and conditioning. What can I help you do? You know, at the end of the day, what do we want to get out of this activity, this strength and conditioning piece of the pie or holistic training piece of the pie, if, if I can provide that for you? Uh, and, and if you take that and, and I started to take that mindset, I think, more at USC. And, and I've said this before, and, I, and I'm thankful for it because it translates well to the NBA. And, and again, Josh touched on it. And that's, I think, the most important piece right right from the beginning is I'm just looking at an athlete in front of me and they might be N equals one. I may not have them dive into all of the other testing that we do and say that it's basketball testing. It might be like, man, in your game, what do you need to do? Like what it, it, for you to have 10 years in the NBA and get another contract, you need that baby hook. And that's all you need, man. Or you need to be able to offensive rebound like you're an offensive rebounding beast. You're Tristan Thompson. You're going to make 10 mil a year off of just being a beast down low and defending the rim. Well, how do I test if if my interventions as a strength coach are making a difference in what matters for that person? And if it doesn't, then why am I power cleaning, going into the rack and squatting, fixing it up for bench press? doing some auxiliaries and leaving that's not what that's not an athlete centered approach in my opinion mm -hmm. and if you what outcome the critical piece what outcome measures are you looking for and if you can't give me a clear picture on that then it's like or if i can't give the athlete a clear picture on that then what are we really doing we're kind of just aimlessly loading this athlete which can serve a purpose just general issue loading that is a critical piece for a basketball player um, but it should be more than that, right? So, so I think that's the similarity, you know, or it should be the similarity from college to pro. And I know, you know, Josh's mindset on that is is spot on. Um, it, it, there, the difference, I mean, the reality is the difference is the money. The difference is the the financial piece that's now involved. There's so many cooks in the kitchen. Uh, this is this is a piece I'll touch on shortly, but is is because it's so like you can't measure it. It's the psychosocial piece where it's like. Now that you have $25 million or you make $25 million a year, how many people do you have around you? Uh, how many, how many uh, dependents do you now have with all this money? And, and you know, so that, that piece is, I think, the piece that then changes sometimes the commitment to training, the consistency. Uh, you know, guys, it, you know, the college world, it, there was more in, in, you know, guys now would call it college right? Is like, we want you to be in on time and wear the right gear and tie your shoes and, you know, all of those things that are like, they're, they're looked at as so college -y. And it's weird. It's like, why, why is that college -y? But it, it, that's NBA culture, man. Like, you know, so, so a player knows that what, whatever they do during the week, whether, you know, it's like, sometimes it'll be, you know, I don't want to divulge too much to, uh, to paint a negative light, but you are going to play regardless. You're going to get on the court and you're going to get your 20 minutes if we need you for 20. Whether or not you got your free lifts in or you came in early or late or whether, you know, whatever. Uh, whether you wore the right shirt on that day. So um, they, it's, a player's, it's a player's league. And that's, that's a reality. That's, that's okay. Um, I think there are advantage, advantages and disadvantages, you know, like everything else. Um, and if you are a great person, again, take that athlete centered approach, 
If you are a good person to them, then it doesn't matter how much money they make. You are a good coach. You are providing me with something beneficial as a strength coach for me. Then I'm with you. Then I'll come in early because I know I'm getting better. You know, I know I'm doing something purposeful. So that that I think, you know, it, it, it'll always come back to that, that this is I, I am just thinking of solving issues for this athlete or achieving goals for this athlete. And that's where we'll, and I'm sure we'll get into it. That's why we have to be open minded to all the tools and all the methods. Uh, like I don't subscribe to any tribe. I'm not a part of any just like this is my this is this is my church. This is my gospel. Like. I never want to be a part of that because I know I'm going to need to use everything at some point in my career. I'm going to need to use something obscure that I know about that. It's like, man, if I didn't learn this skill and I wasn't open minded to this technique, I wouldn't be able to cater to this player's this player's needs or, or their goals. You know, so um, so it, a lot of similarities, I think. I think there should be more similarities in strength and conditioning, how the, it's approached in college and pro. Um, and really, the only difference is, is once you start making that money, it's, it's just a different ballgame. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, one, one of the things I'll, I'll touch on, which, you know, Chris kind of brought up a little bit is, uh, you know, at, at the NBA level, especially because they, there is so much money involved um, and you're dealing with grown men. You know, when I was at Chicago, I had guys that were, you know, 13, 15 years older than me who had won NBA championships before, who had, you know, had success long before I came in the picture. Um, so how are you getting these guys to trust you? How are you getting them to, to believe in, um, you know, the fact that, that you can help them, the fact that you have their best interests in mind? Um, you know, and then also, like what Chris said, they, they have so many people around them in their ear telling them to do this or that or, or whatever. So the foundation there, um, you know, I found a, a, as a young strength coach was everything revolved around my ability to, to connect with these guys as human beings, as people. Like, you know, none of what I knew from a technical or, or scientific standpoint mattered whatsoever if I can't have a conversation with them. You know, and not just a conversation about basketball, but a conversation about life. You know, what are their interests? What are their hobbies? Who are the key people in their life? Um, and, and one of the things I found there that was really, really valuable was, you know, after games, everybody's leaving, you're walking through the tunnel. Well, their brother, their mom, their dad, their best friends, they're all hanging out waiting for them. I always took the time to stop and talk to those people, have relationships with them, um, because that's their support group, you know. So now I think that helps even further strengthen that relationship with, with the athlete um, to where at the NBA level they don't have to do what you're asking them to do. They just, they just don't. You know, the, the only thing that you can hold over their head is maybe a fine, but, um, you know, I always liken it. it, it it's like, you know, Joe, if we're asking you to do a workout and you say, man, I really don't want to do it. We say, OK, well, um, give me ten dollars and you don't have to do it. I mean, that's that's the equivalent of what it means to them. You go, ah, all right, here's here's ten bucks. You know, no, no big deal. Um, it's kind of the same way for them at the college level. You know, there's there's almost and I think it's changing. But when I got into into the college environment, um, there's there's sort of this culture of as a strength coach or even as a coach in general I'm a dictator you mm. do what I say because I said so and I really don't need to explain it any further than that you know everything is structured um, your workouts are at set times you, you know obviously practice always is um, but in terms of lifting and, and study tables and, and whatever else that they have um, so I think it's it's very easy to get caught into that uh, that world as a coach to where um, you know you sort of take that approach instead of you know I felt fortunate coming from the NBA first and learning the importance of those relationships and then that's the approach I took at the college level is you know what these guys are going to end up uh, doing the things that we need them to do that are going to help them. Because at the core of it all, we have a relationship because I'm able to connect with that person as a human being because I'm able to 
um, kind of have the humility to, to admit when I'm wrong, to be able to involve them in that process, um, to be able to defer to them at times, to let them, you know, kind of have a day. Um, because in the NBA level, you have to do that. If you try and, you know, puff up your chest with a guy and, and uh, get into a battle of egos, you may lose that guy and never get him back again. You know, at the college level, it's like, yeah, they, they got to do what, what, what you're telling them to do. Um, but if, if they don't believe in it, there's not going to be any intent behind it. Um, so I think you're not going to be nearly as successful. No, yeah, no, I, 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 yeah. Go. no. Oh, sorry, Joe. Um, it, like I love in this piece, it's a, it's an important piece. Obviously, it's something that I think we talk about. We talk about all the time is is the relationship piece, and you know, Josh, Josh, you're hitting the nail on the head of just like you know it, the NBA example of there's so many times where you're right, you're you're walking to stuff. Like we spend so much time together because of traveling and, and the season and whatever, uh, but. After a game, it's prime time. Like there's so many fam, there's so much family and friends and people that you could get to know, and the the folks that I've gotten to know um, that are that are just in their lives and it's not basketball related. Um, those are the best relationships I've had, and, and so that is so true. And I think the other, you know, I was going to touch on, um, it, like the relationship piece first and foremost. I, I can't under I can't undervalue that importance, but also of like how do you get that buy-in? Is man if like, I don't not to make this sound negative, but if you if you are good, if you are doing good things with this person and you are applying intelligent concepts and you are somebody who is who is who is good at your craft and knowledgeable at what you're doing and you're applying good, uh, you know, good knowledge or, you know, whatever. Not that you have to be this like genius person, but I think we have less conversations about the relationship piece because like that's man you're a human being you should be doing that you know and i know some people have a tougher time with that than others but the the piece that is is less than stellar or subpar across the landscape is what is being done in the weight room so it's like that if if i'm doing something with an athlete that is based off of a back and forth assessments you know setting goals all this sort of stuff and I am able to articulate a good reason to that person that's layman's terms that makes sense to him. And I and then, then I then apply that into our training sessions to say, hey, this is why we are doing this exercise. This is why we are, are you know, testing today or why we are doing these certain tests. And then and we have an outcome measure saying that uh, some sort of force plate data, uh, we have a goal for that that we want to see something increase with that something with contact time something with repeated sprint ability something with an n equals one test that's in, that's very specific to the athlete maybe something in pick and roll or something with footwork or a point guard reacting uh you know john wall going coast to coast getting around cones reacting to lights that might be an n equals one test for one of our athletes okay you know if i have that for that athlete then i think your buy-in is there even if you got a guy that like Hates training, uh, yeah. Get that, get that dog in there, Joe. Come on now. Yeah, I got, a, I got a two hundred pound English mastiff who decided to come up on the yeah, couch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got the fourth comment today. Welcome, what? Mango, everybody. <laughs> um, but, but that's, I think that's a huge piece as well. You put both of those things together. Obviously, like you have that great relationship with the guy, and in the great relationship is step one because you can do anything in training if you have a great relationship with a guy. Good, bad, <laughs> ugly, whatever. Um, and then, and you have that relationship and you're rolling with training. And I think then if you, you keep that rolling for the long term with then good training, uh, that's being applied, you know? Um, and I know that's, that's, I, and I hope we get into it, you know, the X's that means like, Hey, what are the X's to O's here? Because like, what does good mean? Like, who am I to say that? Like we're doing good stuff and you're doing bad stuff and that's fair. Um, but I think there's some stuff that you shake your head at around the country still with strength and conditioning that if it was better, then I think we have more smooth sailing with our athletes in terms of like their desire to train. No, definitely. So obviously this little first part, a ton to unpack. Um, you know, you guys make great points in terms of the differences from, again, not to call it a dictatorship, but there's much more rigid control in the collegiate world, given the nature of the student athlete dynamic and they're not paid professionals versus 
the professional world where they're, you know, a guy who's making 20 million a year has a little more say in their own, you know, programming and their own thing, whether you like it or not, and whether they need you or not. There's all kinds of elements that go into the trust, the buy-in, and that's, you know, from the youth sport to the professional athlete, if you're a coach and you can create positive buy-in and give kids a reason to believe in you and give them solid and good training, they're going to get better and they're going to believe in you more. And then the second layer of that onion, per se, is building the next, building the network with their connected people. You know, I think one of the things as a collegiate guy, I never worked in the pro setting. You know, I spent a lot of time at competitions watching my athletes compete. And I would have parents come up to me, say, oh, you know, and it's always, you know, the kids would talk to their parents about me, you know, or, you know, a family member or a boyfriend, girlfriend, you know, whoever it was, brother, sister. And I always made it a point to take time to connect with that person because that goes back to actually caring. You can prove to that person you really, really care by taking the time to be open and honest with dialogue and communication. So all that stuff, I think, is the key elements to being and having a successful program. So now let's shift into exactly what you just said, Chris, and it's a perfect interlude is what's actually good. You know, what do you guys having two successful programs and we can debate. This is the best part of the X's and O's because you can debate the philosophical side of this style, this methodology, yada, yada. But and we just unpacked it and said, well, it's all individual. So let's start with what would you you know, obviously some of our audience is young up and comers, high school level. So let's start with three categories. If you are the young teenage basketball athlete looking to get better from the physical training side, what are the one or two key things you each would focus on and why? And then let's bring that up to the more elite level, you know, recruited college high school athlete, you know, who's a senior, junior, actually getting offers, actually going to be somewhere playing, you know, what do you think they need, right? Mm -hmm. And then we'll start with those two, and then I have a third one for you as well. So, Chris, actually, since you mentioned it, you start that young, say, 14 to 17, and then that actual ready-to-go 17 to 19-year-old. Yeah, the, the uh, you know, I love talking about the youth training piece because um, I think inevitably that's that's the show, man. Uh, you know, I think there's there's a lot of talk, you know, in professional basketball, especially now. I think ESPN picks up a lot of this. The media picks up a lot about this performance stuff that's that's now more a part of especially the NBA world. So, you know, it, it's so opposite of what it should be. You know, the the resources, the money, the great strength coaches, the great, you know, analytics people, the great physical therapists, we should be catering to these young kids, man. Because it's like, at the end of the day, I will always have the excuse that this person's an adult now. Like they're already patterned up. They're just, their window is close. You know, their window of trainability is so small or nil uh, and it's just sort of management, you know, these bad patterns and these things that they've developed over the years because they've specialized in basketball, you know, those or baseball or any sport like those things are like in reality, you're probably not changing that stuff. You know, like you're not changing much. Um, and now it's just a matter of management. Hey, I know this is bad and like oh, the ankle sprains or this or that. And so you try to just manage that survival uh, in the NBA. So, you know, with the, with these younger kids. It, it, as far as basketball training is concerned, and if we were to talk specifics, and I've said this before in previous situations where, you know, the the movement strategy piece, and, and I hate these words functional training or, you know, oh, we train movements, not muscles, or, you know, what does movement strategy even mean? But, um, and so I'm not talking about, oh, these kids need this functional training. Uh, but if, if these kids had somebody around them that could just be, they could educate them on uh, weight room movements. So if you learned how to hinge and squat and horizontally push and pull with your upper body and vertically push and pull and all these like sort of foundational things that we as strength coaches all know are so important. Um, and if it was done in a sensible way uh, and, and what is a sensible way? And an example for me is, the owner, how do you take ownership of a movement? And I think this is where the part whole method comes into play. 
is you be exposed to parts of all these movements, take ownership in those positions, ISO holds, slow tempos, all these sorts of things, time under tension, all things that don't need any external resistance. And you take ownership of the bottom position of a squat. You take ownership of how you put, what is your strategy to find your original position, to find upright because you, are, you have changed levels from here down to here and you want to find standing again. What's your strategy to do that if you're using a squat? Uh, and I like what what kid is being taught that because what you get then with that kid squatting in high school is what we see. We see a bar in somebody's back. We see their torso falling over. We see a predominantly low back strategy. They don't know how to use their quads. They don't know how to dorsiflex. They don't know how to reference the ground through their heels. You know, all these things that are so messy and we're like, oh, we're going to fix them all, you know, and it's like, no, we should be fixing this or we should be uh, setting the foundation. Yeah, when somebody's 10, 12 years old, 14 years old. So it, it, the method, the examples, and I want to give as many specifics as I can and go through this library, is I would use uh, for a squat, I'm using a wall supported squat. Um, and not like, and I've said this before, like not your mom and pop's uh, uh, wall squat where your legs are shot out in front of you and you're pushing like back into the wall because you could do that for years. You know, what is what is, what do you want a squat to look like when somebody is off of a wall? Mimic that. They need to show ankle flexion, dorsiflexion. They need to show knee flexion. They need to show hip flexion with an upright torso that is being aided. Uh, the upright torso is being aided by that support from the wall. And mm -hmm. an isometric hold in for 30, 40 seconds is, is very, very tough. And so that is getting an athlete stronger. That is growing muscle. That is doing all the things that you want to do with this young basketball athlete without the damage that they probably are incurring in normal strength in like a lot of the strength and conditioning programs or if they were getting into a gym by themselves and what they were doing on their own. It's like, man, if you just hammer this stuff first before adding that external resistance, you're making way more headway for the long game. You're playing the long game if you slow take that slow cooking approach. And so that's your squat. What's your what's your hinge? Well, if you know if you know how to teach a hinge, and maybe that athlete needs a little bit of support. So I'll put maybe some ha hands on top of a box or a counter or whatever you have to allow them a little bit of support to control gravity. And then, then I teach my hinge. What are what are the what are the intricacies of a hinge with a good foot interaction with the ground? Your knees were uh, there's a slight bend in your knee. We're flexing and posteriorly translating your hips to load your hip musculature. Okay, can you do that? Can you hold that position? Can you breathe in that position when you get fatigued and the time under tension is is as in, we've gotten to 30, 40 seconds? Do you still keep that position? Um, so that's your hinge. Uh, your push-up, your push-up is a push-up plank, a bear hold. Um, take ownership of that top position of a push-up. That's an, that's a good place to start. Uh, a row is the same thing. Do a horizontal row on TRX straps and do an ISO hold. Uh, vertical pull, a lat pull-down machine, a uh, vertical push. A vertical push can get crazy. Like that's this is where like like a vertical push is tough. Like, what do you do for a vertical push? I don't know. Like, I would do some carries. I would do some like bottoms up carries, some 90, 90 stuff to start learning what this position for pressing means. Like what, what position do we have to set in order to press overhead? Uh, and then from there in all of those things, then it's, what's the next step? Is it, you did an isometric hold first on some stuff. Maybe you do an eccentric, some eccentric work with support so that would be a supported squat for me that would be like a, a handle supported squat i'm using the handle supports so i can keep a relatively upright torso and then for those out there who are saying like why do we need that for especially basketball players but i think a lot of other sports as well just a lot of athletes in general they need it's like for you guys listening go try to squat do a body weight squat on your own it probably doesn't look that good and it's just a hard thing for these guys to squat with an upright torso because they want to find that hyperextension back uh, stability. And they're, they want to just dive into that in a squat. And a lot of guys are scared to dorsiflex at their ankles. So they don't want to they don't want to bring their knees forward or allow their knees to track over their feet. Combination of those two things, basketball players just need some support in front of them so they can kind of like think like a high rise, uh, like a motorcycle, like 
I need the handles in front of me so I can kind of lean back a little bit more and spare my back and load my quads, you know? So that's, that's your squat equivalent. What's your deadlift equivalent? Maybe it's that eccentric tempo with still with maybe some support in front of you. Um, the push up is now an eccentric push up only. Um, I'll do a push up that is uh, four sec, maybe a four second eccentric tempo and not even worry about pressing up. Like with a young kid, just learn to control the downward movement of a push up. Once you get down to whatever your bottom position is, then just relax. Then, you know, I'll have, I'll cue, bend your knees, just kind of push yourself back reset into that push-up plank um just because i know how hard it is for that athlete to push up so good point to be made for those out there if you're having your kids do like 20 push-ups as penalty or you throw out like 30 push-ups as a number to do you know how hard 30 push-ups is if you do them right you know so it's like do i'm saying do a four second tempo and don't even worry about pressing up because that one rep is so hard so put that into perspective and again, you can, with that push-up tempo, do a 10-second eccentric, you know? Like all these things don't need any external resistance or a weight room. And that's where I think we should emphasize with these younger kids is how many boxes we have to check. Uh, the, the, sim, the boxes that are more on this like simplistic, lower risk, movement education side before you even touch barbells and kettlebells and all this stuff. And I think why why that's not happening is because people don't have a big menu. Like a strength coach in high school might be like, oh, well, I only know like strength and conditioning to him is only loading with external resistance, is only bench, row, squat, deadlift with barbells. And it's like, you know, we need to provide a, a, a bigger menu and more more strategies that these guys can use, more periodization schemes, more ways to load somebody. Um, that doesn't need to be high risk, you know, so long winded answer to that. But like, and I don't know if we could talk more specific exercises, but I'll shoot it. I'll shoot it to you, Josh, like, you know, in terms of your opinions on this too. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I mean, shoot, I, I probably can't go into any more detail in, in, in terms of everything that Chris talked about with the basic, basic movement patterns. I think the, the biggest thing that I see is um, coaches, whether it be, you know, youth sport coaches, strength and conditioning coaches. Um, but I think you even see it at the, at the college and professional level, um, whether it's, you know, ego and insecurity or, or what it is, um, oftentimes it may be well-intentioned, but we, we try to rush and, and skip ahead in, in, the, uh, in the process. We try to skip steps. So the analogy I always make is, you know, it, it's just in the same way as if I come and I take you guys and I say, hey, today we're going to learn calculus. Well, if you haven't learned algebra yet, you know, we're not going to have very much success at all, all um, being able to pick up this new concept of, of calculus. And so it's the same way. We're, we're trying to build your engine ultimately as an athlete and as strength coaches and, and sport coaches. I think we want to get into all this stuff that's really cool. It's you know making a guy run faster, jump higher, all these sorts of things. It's all these drills that look very quote unquote specific. It, it looks like we're, the things that we're asking them to improve upon out on the court. Um, and then again, like I said, the, the the sort of ego and insecurity of it. Uh, Man, what what will other people think if they walk into my weight room and they see that I have you know 15 athletes or 10 athletes and they're not moving much weight or they're moving very little weight and and a lot of times it, it can be pressure from um, your sport coach above you because they're saying hey so and so is getting thrown around you know they need to get a whole lot stronger they're not physical enough and then um, especially as it relates to basketball. They go, well, you know, defensively, he just he can't get in a stance. He can't move. He can't stay in front of somebody. So they're expecting two things. They're expecting one. Well, you know, he should probably be throwing a bunch of weight around in the weight room. Um, but the weight that is on the bar is not necessarily indicative of how strong you are, especially as it's going to translate to your performance on the court. And I think that's something that we lose sight of as coaches. It's like, 
you know, okay, so and so took their squat up by 50 pounds or 100 pounds, um, but is the integrity of that movement still crap? Because if it is, it didn't do anything to help them out on the court. There's no, there's no connection there. So I think, you know, and especially when you talk about the youth level, but shoot, uh, at the college level, kids that I get as incoming freshmen, I mean, we'll get a guy that's a, a fifth year graduate transfer that's had four years in a collegiate program and you're still teaching them how to move. At the NBA level, you're getting rookies where it's like, yeah, he's a professional and he's a phenomenal athlete, um, but his movement competency is very poor. Um, so being able to step back and understand, um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that really stood out to me taking over at, at Purdue, I had the opportunity, you know, when I came in in the off season, um, I'm dealing with guys who have had three and four years of training. They've they've squatted, they've cleaned, they've you know they've done all this stuff. I had the opportunity to just kind of sit back and watch them for a couple of days. I wanted them to continue to do the things that they had been doing before I came in and I made the adjustments of okay, here's what we're going to do. And the big thing that I saw was the movement, you know, was so poor. Um, and so we actually spent our first probably six to eight weeks, and this is in the in the summer period, we didn't touch a bar, we didn't touch a platform. Um, everything was what Chris mentioned. It was isometric holds, it was dumbbells, cables, um, but then and then it was volume um, of repetitions of, of getting them to squat the right way, getting them to identify those positions like Chris talked about, the bottom of a squat. How am I hinging up, you know, appropriately where I'm loading through my hips and not my spine? Um, being able to do a perfect push-up. So one of the things Chris touched on is one of the ways to be able to do these things because anyone can do it. You know, my my uh, ninety-year-old grandmother can do it. It's how do we reduce load? So something like a, a, a push-up, I can elevate them um, on a box. But what was really interesting, um, you know, especially at the college level, you come in and you and you're training these collegiate basketball players and you go eight weeks, you know, with without really touching weight and you have colleagues around you and, and coaches and people questioning you like, man, we're going to get, you know, pushed around this year. But what was really incredible was how strong they got in the absence of load. So in other words, when their movement quality improved, at the point when, you know, we finally did throw a bar on their back or put a bar in their hands and start having them do um, some different Olympic variants and, and complexes and stuff like that, one, their movement quality was so effective that we were able to add load very, very quickly. Um, but I think the transfer that you saw to the court also um, happened very quickly because I think what's happening is – you're unlocking a lot of their sort of athletic inefficiencies. You're allowing them to um, kind of access the underlying ath athletic qualities that they already have um, and be able to tap into that at a higher level. So the thing I always look at is our job within the performance sector is we are, we are working to make our athletes more effective to make them more efficient, to make the things that they are being asked to do out on the court easier. Um, and I think we do that by getting them to move better, get them stronger, get them faster, those sorts of things um, is, is going to allow them to then execute their sport specific skills um, at a higher level. But again, like I, like I said at the very beginning, we can't flip that pyramid. It's not gonna happen all at once. Um, another example I have, just on the on the standpoint of you know, and Chris will talk about this as well. Is one of the big things you get from basketball coaches is they talk about a guy's ability to defend and stay in front of you know a, a ball handler or whatever. And so, I think what oftentimes we rush into is doing a lot of um, movement oriented drills where it's defensive sliding and it's things that look like the movement quality that we're trying to improve. Um, but here's where we got to really dial back all the layers and kind of peel back the onion of, okay, 
if, if I'm putting them in situations where I'm having them do sports specific type sliding and things like that, um, are they just reinforcing already poor movement patterns? Have I dialed it back to understand first and foremost, can they get into a stance? Do they have a, the mobility just to get into a stance um, mm -hmm. through their you know, ankles and hips and whatever else? Uh, because if they don't, then they're really not going to improve that quality very readily. Do they have the strength to be able to stay in that stance? Have they built up the um, capacity to generate force in a short amount of time to push in the appropriate direction to cut a guy off? Those sorts of things. And that is a long-term process, and that's something that's difficult to get, especially coaches, to understand. Um, being able to speak from experience now going into my, you know, this being my seventh season, we've had uh, really two guys in particular who have come in as freshmen, perimeter players, um, who the knock on them when we got them was offensively they're great, but they can't guard anyone you know, probably in college basketball, let alone the Big Ten. And part of that process was they didn't move well enough through their hips to get into that stance and stay in front of guys. But it was a two-year process to where both these guys, their junior year, one of them was the defensive player of our league, and the other one was first-team all-defense. Um, and that was something where it's just you got to be patient. And I even told our coaches, I told those players specifically, these changes are not going to happen this year. It's going to take time. And so I think, especially at the youth level, it's you look ahead and you see what these college guys are doing, you see what these pro guys are doing, and you try to emulate that right away. But there was a process for them to get there. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think that, especially having lived it in the collegiate setting and also having worked in some youth and, you know, like younger athlete settings, I think that's the key. Um, you know, there's obviously the things the basics done savagely well, you know, produce the best results and all of those kinds of quotes. Um, you know, as a strength coach, wearing my strength coach hat, I think of, you know, people doing triphasic, how recently in the last year, that's been the biggest thing. Because like you guys both talked about, it helps people take ownership of the movements by slowing sound, slowing down and controlling some of the fun fundamental parts you know, whether it's a time under tension, whether it's tempo, you know, manipulating certain variables. I think it gets bastardized when people just start throwing load on it. Again, um, Cal Dietz, triphasic training for anyone listening. Uh, you know, Joe Ken, block zero. Tremendous developmental basic level things, but then get bastardized because like you both talked about, people try and skip steps or go somewhere where they're not ready. Um, the one comment I'll make with my strength coach hat on is I used to tell kids in the weight room, uh, the weight room and every movement you do in the weight room in, is like shooting a free throw. You don't step up to the line and do something different every time. You don't step up. And even though the situation mm -hmm. may be different, you might be fresh, you might be tired. The game might be on the line. The game might not be on the line. But that free throw for you should be a consistent thing every single time. So just like in the weight room, every movement, no matter if you're tired, you're fresh, whatever it is, you're constantly trying to recreate that free throw mentality of ownership of the movement, you know, perfect technical application to maximize efficiency. So with that kind of stuff, you know, and we're starting to get towards the end, one of the things, you know, obviously knowing Chris for a long time and Josh, um, you know, having, you know, known many people who know you and uh, like what I said when I met you, we have a similar style. We all view this as a holistic process. It's not just lift weights. It's not just do yoga. It's not just X or Y. And Chris, you alluded to it earlier. It's how can I take my full set of skills and my full gamut of you know experience, even if it's something little, and apply it to positively benefit an athlete? So obviously you can, sport nutrition product. Let's hit on that idea, that holistic approach from a nutrition standpoint. And what do you and how do you work with your guys from a nutrition, whether it's, you know, Josh, I know you use you can to Chris. Obviously, I'm sure you guys have a nutritionist on staff, so you may not even deal with that, um, you know, because that's not your cup of tea in this role you have. But let's talk nutrition. Let's talk the other things holistically that go into being a high level basketball athlete. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, like you said, Joe. 
for the environment that I've been in, uh, you know, I've, I've taken care of some nutrition stuff in the past. I have, you know, now in my role, I, I don't dip my toe in the nutrition side because we're lucky enough to have uh, a nutritionist and a chef uh, and those resources there. So, um, but you know, the, the toughest, the toughest thing, um, you know, especially basketball uh, from a nutrition perspective, uh for these guys to understand like what's what's you know to sell them on why it would be important uh that you know what they put in their body could change how they play is a is a tough sell and it's kind of like you know it's it's that long play again like you 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 don't i I don't think you come in you come in hot on a on a guy as a rookie and change their whole world because in nutrition and just you know demean and and be negative about certain foods that they may be maybe eating or this and that because they don't get it you know like you know we were talking about before with, with doing algebra before calculus like you know me talking to somebody about gut health and microbiome and you know uh uh different nutrients that are coming from different foods it's like even that they're like you know what what are you talking about like I have I have eaten the same thing every day and it's been, you know, waffles and pancakes and bread and and all these things and sugar and candy and all that stuff. And I've drinking, you know, all these drinks that have Gatorade and, you know, just all like a ton of sugar. And, and we would be like, oh, my God, that's so terrible. But they got to the NBA. So, you know, how do how do you start those inroads um, and and make it important for them? Um, it is not an easy task to be honest. And, and what does holistic training mean to an NBA basketball player? I don't know. This is another one of those things where I'd be like, I wish maybe we get these kids in the NBA 10 years from now that are more used to that. Like when they were 14 years old or 15 or they, in their high school, they had more healthy options or they started learning more about nutrition in that time. And then maybe we're able to make some changes, but I think now it's, it's, so where, I think there's just small, there's small inroads that get made over time and there's an acceptance that it's probably never going to be how you want. And that's, that's the unfortunate thing I think with some, with some aspects of the NBA and and players in the NBA, man, culturally, just like, you know, where, where a lot of guys come from, it's like, man, like all of us, we want our, what's comfortable for us. We want, you know, things that are, that taste good. Like, you know, we can go into the whole concept of, you know, how absurd it is that we as humans have turned eating into a pleasurable activity. So it's not even close to being thought of as fuel for most people. It is like, man, I can't wait to get home and eat this. And it's like, you know, I'm not all about this. Like, let's compare everything to ancestry. But like a caveman wasn't saying that he was like, man, I got to kill this and I got to eat this to survive, you know? So, you know, we are telling this guy that for 20 some odd years or 18, 20 years, you have treated food as a really happy, pleasurable activity for you, and you've made food taste good for you. And I'm saying, yeah, man, eat that like that thing that I think is delicious, but they, they think is bland and terrible and whatever. Um, you know, they that that's just that's it, it's not you're not going to hit home runs with with food intake um, in early in guys' careers, especially, and you may never hit that home run with them. Uh, and they're still going to succeed. And I think you have there. There has to be some acceptance with that, not only in nutrition, but in, in training in general, sleep and all the holistic things we think about when it comes to you know, bettering yourself as an athlete. Now, to swing this to, to more of like a you can supplement oriented thing, I think where you can hit a home run is good supplementation, because if something tastes good and something if you are saying, hey, ingest this for energy during a game. Hey, what flavor is that? Oh, we have, we got fruit punch or something. It's like, they're in for that, you know? So that's an easy one to sell. If it's man, take a couple pills, try to be consistent with it every day, like fish oil, multivitamin, whatever. That's an easy one. That's a layup for most guys. Protein shake. Hey, this is literally a chocolate or vanilla shake. And it's like, okay, like I'm down with that. Hey man, if you drink this post game, like you know, uh, it, it has protein in it and it'll help your muscles heal and this and that. And that's an easy sell because it's like all I have to drink is, or is this chocolate flavored thing. It's like, OK, mm-hmm. cool. Uh, bars are an easy one. It's like, you know, uh, some sort of wet, whether it's a protein, like kind of chocolatey, peanut buttery sort of thing situation or whether it's like, a, 
you know, some sort of carbohydrate oriented, like sugar boost, like all those things are, are, you know, nowadays, like where 10, 15 years ago when we were getting like, when I, I remember getting creatine or like uh, protein shakes or whatever, it was, it tastes awful. But nowadays it's like, here, taste this. And they're like, oh my God, this is like the things that I usually like. So let's roll. And maybe that's your first inroad. And then year two, it's like, hey, you know what also has protein in it? Like good quality meats, you know? And it's like, that's, that's when they start maybe going to the kitchen more. And it's like, you start making that inroad. But I think an easy first one is, and, and we preach routine. We preach, you know, building good habits, right? As everybody does. And if you're a rookie coming into the NBA and you're getting this whirlwind of money and fans and, you know, admiration and all this sort of stuff. And like, what habits are you building? And are you consistent with, with those habits? And when it comes to nutrition, man, that's, you're, you're missing, guaranteed. There's nobody that's consistent you know, in this environment and with this culture and like whatever. Um, but what is the only way you have a shot at being consistent is like, it's probably some supplementation for a while, you know, just so you can be like, Hey, I know you at least have something that's benefiting you from a, you know, a physiology standpoint, some sort of fuel that is benefiting you that you can get through and perform in this game or this practice. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing Chris hit on is you have to be able to make that connection for them of how, you know, the, the nutrition and, you know, things like sleep hygiene, um, how that's impacting uh, not only their performance, but also their health. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of things nutritionally um, where, where it's impacting things like inflammation, things like recovery from injury, recovery from soreness, those sorts of things. Um, and again, we're an environment of elite sport to where, you know, when, when guys are coming to my level, they were all the best player on their team, the best player in their state. Um, and, and then the guys who make it from our level up to Chris's level, again, best player on their team, best player in their conference, maybe the best player in the country, um, but the, but the further up you go, the margin for error becomes, uh, less and less. And so what's difficult is we get these kids 18, 19 years old and, you know, McDonald's all American or, um, you know, Mr. Basketball or whatever they were. And they ate McDonald's and Chick-fil-A and milkshakes and donuts and, you know, fruit loops and all this stuff. So why should they change what what incentive do they have to change because they can go they can still go out and drop 20 they can still go you know score 30 um, but i think where you see it manifest itself is at our level the guys that are going that are on the fringe i think that can be the difference between them being able to go on and play in the nba um, or they go overseas um, and i think it's it's the guys who are uber talented that are going to make the NBA no matter what. Um, but then they get into the NBA, and Chris can speak to this a little bit more, um, and they don't last beyond, you know, maybe three, four, five years at the most. And it's, it's like this shooting star. It's, it's three, four years where they are phenomenal. They're unbelievable. But at a certain point, it starts to catch up to them. And so I think that's where – you know, for us, that's where we, we, we try to use some of the different technology, um, some of the, uh, the wellness questionnaires, start to make that connection to, you know, so they actually recognize, man, I feel like crap today. Okay, well, what were the things that you put into your body? How have you been sleeping? Hmm, it's not just, you know, some random occurrence that you feel like crap. You've slept for four hours, you know, each of the last three nights. You didn't eat until one in the afternoon each of these days, you know, and, and, and then start to connect it of, hey, give me one day where you sleep for 10 hours and you, you eat this type of food or whatever it is. Um, you know, let's do that for one or two days or whatever and now see how you feel because they're so used to your body just norms. So you just compare against the last 24 hours, essentially. So they've just always felt this way their entire life. It's just normal to them. But all of a sudden, you know, sleep in particular, I've had guys where I say, hey, the next three days I want you to get 30 hours of sleep. And what you do out of that, 
um, you know, afterwards, that's on you. But I promise you how you're going to feel, this is going to change you. It's going to change your habits. And they come back and they're like, man, it's incredible how you feel when you actually sleep. And it's like, well, no crap. But, like, they haven't experienced that before. So the nutritional side of things I think is the same. Um, and I know even speaking from my own experience, but I think as most of us, I grew up, I ate like crap. I ate pizza, mac and cheese, cereal, donut. I mean, I had the worst diet ever. And then all of a sudden you start making some of those changes and then you go back and you're like, man, how did I eat like that? Like, or, or, or the time that you do, you just feel terrible. But what Chris hit on, the best thing that we can try to do is, is interject with a lot of the supplements because we, we can control a lot of that. Um, and then as you start to get guys that buy in a little bit more um, and become more committed to the process, um, you know, now maybe you can make subtle changes here and there. You go from fried chicken to grilled chicken, but it's, it's the same thing as training. You have to identify where are they at and where are they starting from, and you have to meet them where they are because you're not going to make, you know, all those – all those changes at once, and so you know, speaking uh, as far as you can, you can in particular. Um, I know for our guys, one where you know, at first you get them to 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 drink it, and you know, we'll do it in in a practice environment to say, hey, this is something that's going to help your performance. Um, if for whatever reason you don't like it. I'm not going to make you drink it, but just try this for this week of practice. Um, and those sorts of things then start to become staples um, of their uh, preparation. And especially for us, uh, as part of our game day preparation, that's a, that's a huge piece. Like all of our guys will drink a you can shake uh, beforehand with, uh, and we'll throw our beet juice right in there. Um, and so if you can get that one little win – now maybe they're starting to come to you and say, hey, well, what else can I do? You know, now I, I start to have guys who were on the road and they come to me and they say, um, you, you order my post-game meal. I'll eat whatever you pick because I know that's going to help me. But you got you to gotta find a, a small victory and start from there. Mm -hmm. No, 100%. Um, you know, as we're getting towards the end of this, I, I think you guys are hitting on – kind of, you know, some people always look for the specific X and O. I need to do, you know, in the weight room, I need to do this many sets and this many reps of this exercise or nutrition. I need to eat this one thing, but it's not that cookie cutter and one size fits all. So, you know, I think you guys are hitting on it across the board from the training side, from the mental side, from the nutrition side. There's the small steps. There's the incremental consistency that builds the elite athlete it's there's no one magic thing if there was we'd all be that i mean like you said josh earlier like i'd still be an athlete chris would still be an athlete you'd still be an athlete like we'd be those guys now um if we could just do that one magic thing so kind of to leave um you know and wrap this up on kind of the the one last point you want to make or the one thing you know for me i'll take a nutrition one my athletes the more water i could get them to drink it was amazing you know, I would get guys coming to me and they'd up their water intake, feel better, play better, not cramp as much. You know, water for me was always the thing I harped on guys, carrying your water ball around, drinking your water. So whether it's a nutrition thing, a training thing, uh, a, a mental psych thing, you know, what's kind of the one thing you would tell any athlete, basketball player, whoever – um, that they could take from you right now to improve their performance tomorrow if they were consistent with it. You got it, Josh? I was going to let you open up. I was trying to piggyback off you, man. <laughs> I got you. I got you. I'll go. I'll go. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, hey, you know, the 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 training the training world is definitely is is where my passion lies, and, and it's my wheelhouse. And you know, the um, you know, we could we could talk for hours on this stuff, and and to convey like an understanding of like Joe you said the the X's and O's is so hard unless like you watched me coach or I'm coaching you um but I think it's still important to try like how much you know examples that I can give and, and things with training uh because to go to your question Joe like it's kind of this one thing and and with with younger athletes to to kind of expand on on what we were talking about before 
just mm-hmm. from a general concept standpoint, I think we get in trouble, like I was kind of mentioning before, with external resistance and, and loading guys up uh, externally. So that's I'm referring to, you know, you, you have a dumbbell, a barbell, a kettlebell involved. There's something else other than your body weight and gravity that's that's affecting this load. And uh, we, jump to, we jump in there too quickly. And we – to and I mentioned it kind of before with an athlete creating buy-in, like being really good at what you do, being really knowledgeable at what you do. And if you, if you, uh, if you're looking at this youth athlete and you're, and you're a problem solver and you're playing the long game and you have, you, you understand that this athlete has goals of continuing on and, and wanting to play basketball. Um, you know, you are the person that is like more of the don't mess this up person, you know, because I think there's more harm than good than can be done or that is done a lot of times in those environments when kids are young. So I encourage you to do uh, what I would consider the, the least risk activities. And a lot of those activities involve the X's and O's like I talked about before from a weight room uh, perspective. Now, classic strength coaches, we always just talk about the weight room. Um, but in addition to those low risk things, there are low risk things that are involved in all aspects of training, whether that is that is uh, what I would call like speed, agility, quickness work or uh, conditioning work. Um, you know, we aren't as well versed as strength coaches in those realms as I think we should. We aren't as well versed as strength coaches uh, in the anatomy and physiology realm. And, and I'm guilty of that as well. Uh, and so, you know, and I'll say this first. If I am saying I'm a problem solver to this point uh, about our kind of like noviceness or lack of knowledge um, as far as what we should have, uh, if you have that necessary knowledge, then you're a problem solver. Then because I know biomechanics, because I know anatomy and phys, because I know um, how to apply these training concepts in a really intricate way, then I'm just looking at you and saying, man, if I'm a weight room example, I'm putting you in a position because I know that position challenges the thing I want to be challenged. And you know, if you know that, then you can be a problem solver in all situations. It may not look like an exercise. And this is like, let's get out of this box of squatting, deadlifting, bench press, whatever. These are just positions that long, long time ago, some person who invented lifting was like, hey, the way you changed the level there and you went down and up, we could probably train that if we added some more weight to it. But hey, the way you pick that thing up off the floor, hey, what do you feel on that? Like, oh, you feel your legs? Like you're training your legs and that's a deadlift. And it's like, what if it wasn't that? And I had this conversation the other day with somebody and this is an absurd comparison, but what if it was uh, like rubber, like rubber bands grew on trees and hundreds of years ago, somebody pulled these rubber bands off and just started doing exercises with these bands. We, it would have been bands that was the thing that we said was exercise. But unfortunately now, and I say unfortunately because it's it's so high risk, it's steel, it's bars, it's it's dumbbells, it's it's squat racks. And it very easily could have not been that. So think outside of that box. I encourage you to think outside of that box and do the things that this kid can do without any negative auxiliary effects. And I guarantee you that's not barbell back squatting. I guarantee you that's not barbell deadlifting. I guarantee you teaching a, a, a Olympic list to a, to a 12-year-old is probably not something we should do. Like, should we jump the? Should we jump them so much because they're basketball players? You know, we see so many kids on the uh, the Vertimax. Um, it's like no, like man, what, what? How did? And we talk about this with, with our staff, and we will challenge other staff members. And, may, and the biggest question that comes up is how did you get there? Why did you go there? So you as a coach, why did you go to the Vertimax? What boxes did you check that that athlete then had a right to step on a Vertimax and add bands and add all this stuff? Like what was your process? Like why you checked the boxes of, of outcome measures of jumping and you said the only way to get to the goal, the next goal, was to add resistance, was that band resistance to the jump. If you say that to me and you say you believe that adding bands is the only way to get their vertical from 32 to 34, and if they get their vertical to 34, then they'll get an MBA contract or Division One scholarship. If you say that to me and you're definitive, I'm with it. Do it. But 
let's move away from from that for especially our young kids and i think that's you know like i said you training is so important to me because if you check that box or you do things well with the young kids then when i get them in the nba it's a much easier road and and you know i i say you know with 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 training and i think josh touched on this and i remember making a mental note and and wanting to to revisit this but it, the first thing you said was something about like with loading these guys and it made me think of like when training actually occurs with people it, i i know that one for as an example one of our guys can squat probably 400 pounds you know something like that and right now he's only squatting like two 200 225 you know because the limiting factor right now is confidence it's technique it's coaching it's all this stuff he doesn't know how to like man this bar that's whatever this it's a safety bar and we have the handle supports it's like oh this is weird and it's like we're not even training yet with this kid and i have limited time because it, there's a difference between demonstrating your ability to do something and training uh, uh an exercise and he's just demonstrating an ability he already has he already can squat 225 pounds for whatever 10 but it's like we're not training yet because he could he could do that walking into the gym it's the quicker you can get rid of the limiting factor of technique on something then we're actually training so go back to that you think you as a youth strength coach enable me to get rid of the limiting factor of technique quicker so when i get the guy and i say let me see you deadlift and i'm like oh man you look good on deadlifts okay we train you know like we were there's no like technique and figuring out you know this and that and then like making them comfortable with lifting weight do the thing that the athlete is good at and then you're and then you're training and and you know this 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 stick of square peg in a round hole because you see everybody has racks now so everybody thinks squatting is so good and deadlifting is so good for athletes man Let's get out of let's get out of that box and and spend our time doing doing things that you have and I'm going on a tangent here but doing things that you have an outcome measure for like if you don't know like what's your outcome measure for barbell back squatting like is it to squat more or is there an outcome measure related to the sport that you believe the stress being incurred from a barbell back squat will improve that outcome measure that is allowing this person to be a better basketball player like it, can you check all those boxes with everything you do and if not man just go keep regressing regressing and like regressing is not a good word but just going back to figure out like and i'd be more than happy to email you back and forth or talk on the phone for days on what is the simplest version of all these exercises and be able to understand what simple like what what low risk easy exercises are that are still getting the training effect that you need and knowing that a training effect is is happening from this and it's it may not be the 400 pounds that you're squatting but if you set the foundation of in a squat you know the you know what the principles of a squat are you know the strategies of a squat and as an athlete you know what version of the squat you need to use to get a training effect wall squat anterior supported squat kettlebell goblet squat if you know all that like that's what we should be enabling our athletes to do you know and the more variety we throw at them and all this stuff and like hey we want to get in we want to sprinkle in some frc we want to sprinkle in some fms we want to sprinkle in some like random somersaults it's like the more we do that not saying that that's bad the more we do that the less we're just getting a hodgepodge of of an athlete that just comes in and he's like i'm like hey do you know how to deadlift he's like what's that one again is that the one where you put the bar on your back? It's like, oh, no, you know, it's like, I shouldn't be like, you're an NBA basketball player. You've been training for like 10 years, dude. Like, I sh you shouldn't be asking that question, you know? So, um, and I think that starts uh, with the youth training. And, and that would be my piece of like, hey, if you get anything from this, man, and you're catering to youth, know that you got to do things simpler. And you have to have a way better understanding of this stuff than you probably do right now. I think... <clears throat> from my standpoint, you know, I very much uh, come at it from the, the psychological perspective of things. And, and I think that's where <clears throat> a lot of, uh, you know, my own individual approach has, has really evolved over the last, especially four or five years, um, as it specifically relates to our weight room environment. Um, I think the thing, 
as a coach, I think the greatest gift that we can give our athletes or, or help our athletes with is confidence. And I think, you know, by making these different physical improvements and these sorts of things, that's going to lead to increased confidence. Um, but I think that, um, you know, a, a big part of it is kind of giving them freedom and ownership, giving them the freedom to make mistakes, expose them to failure, um, and see that they're able to kind of dust themselves off. They're still alive. You know, nothing has changed about them as a human being um, because they get in these situations, you know, critical moments um, in, in a game environment. Um, what are their mental strategies there? Um, so I think there's there's a lot of things that we do uh, where it, it, it's very much beyond the the X's and O's of training. I think there's there's a lot that we do within our training where I give them the ownership and the freedom um, to come in and say, hey, here's how I'm feeling. Um, this is what I was thinking of doing today with, within training because um, I've also put that responsibility on them to start to learn and understand uh, why we do the different, you know, training modalities that we, we do and um, to start to understand how their body uh, responds to those different things um, because they're going to be, you know, oftentimes they have the best idea of where they're at and what they need. And so if we can expose them to the different tools and, and more effective strategies um, to use in response to those different situations, um, but then have the humility to kind of step back and, and let them sort of lead, let them drive that discussion. And I think that's the thing for, especially as a young coach, it's like you, you want to assert your authority and you want to assert that you're in charge and your program is the greatest. And, you know, I think when you look at it, there's, there's no bad exercises. Um, there's, you know, there's bad coaching or there's exercises used ineffectively or inappropriately. You know, Chris talked about um, have you earned the right to use that exercise? So rather than, you know, we'll do everything. We'll, we'll, we'll throw bars, you know, we'll, we'll squat guys, we'll Olympic lift. Joe, the day you came, we we're, you know, my one guy, he was doing a, a reverse band squat with a pretty heavy weight. <clears throat> and you even saw, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, he ended up making a pretty big jump there, uh, mm -hmm. which was probably a little above, you know, where he should have gone. But he was he was confident that he could get it, um, and I wanted to allow him that opportunity. I I felt as though it's still, you know, it's something that he's done extensively. It's still a, it's still a safe environment. Um, but sometimes even exposing them to that little bit of struggle, that little bit of failure allows them to sort of see what they're capable of because it's testing their limits. So it's like, you know, maybe sometimes they can't do this right now, but by attempting it, they go, okay, well, I'm not that far away. And it, and it sort of gives them that confidence of, okay, I'm, I'm going to get this. And it gives them a little bit more motivation. Um, so I know I've kind of gone on, on my own sort of individual tangent, but I think even, you know, what, what Chris is talking about of can you sort of dissect uh, what your approach is with these athletes and, and, and why you believe in, in training the way that you do, uh, that comes back to our own individual humility um, as a coach to be able to say, man, I was wrong. Man, you know what? I'm doing this, but I really don't have a good reason for it because that's going to happen. But I think if, if we can uh, – kind of embody that, it's going to help our athletes develop more humility. And as they develop humility, they're able to step away and start to see, you know, the things that are their weaknesses. They're able to hopefully develop more of a, of a growth mindset and understand the control that they have to, um, you know, improve aspects of their performance or of their life, um, where a lot of times, especially with these elite athletes, They've been told their, their whole life, you know, how great they are, so they develop a very fixed mindset. They just are great basketball players. They just are fast. They just, you know, and, and so getting them to understand that that's not a fixed thing. It's, it's something that you control. It's something that you, 
that can go away, um, and it's something that can improve. Um, so that's 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 my side of things. Is I, as I really encourage, especially the young co coaches out there. You know, don't get too blinded with the science of the physiology and periodization and all these sorts of things. Um, start to pour yourself into some of the psychological concepts involved. Um, and, and, you know, I really think in, in studying a lot of this and, and reading a lot of different books um, in these areas, you know, the, the psychological ultimately really drives the physiological in so many ways. No, well said. I think, uh, I think we're two peas in a pod on that one. One of the things I've always said to people um, is, you know, the, the degrees in X-Phys and the knowledge, all that stuff is, you know, only about 10% of the job. The other, you know, 80 to 90% of the job, depending on what level you are, what circumstance you have, is getting people to believe in you, understanding other people, and then playing that Game of Thrones political thing. You know, the, the actual time in the weight room training, whoever you're training, is the easiest, but sometimes the least important part of the day, if that makes sense. Because mm -hmm. if you do all the other parts right, that time then becomes, you know, uh, pretty easy to do and you get the most out of it because uh, you don't have all those other distractions and all that other stuff kind of in the webs of things like, you know, we talked about previously. Awesome, guys. Um, you know, damn, we're going, we're almost 90 minutes now. Um, you know, we're all kind of poking. Oh, they just sacked Tom Brady. It's a terrible day. Um, sorry for anyone up there. You are, seeing, you are seeing just ahead of me, man. So, like, I just a Cooks get that, uh, make that catch, and now you're like, oh, he's getting sacked. Like, I was fired up for a second. <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry to anyone out there who's – Chris and I are both Patriots fans, New England guys. Josh is a Bears guy. Sorry to bring that up. Um, so anyone out there who uh, doesn't like the Patriots, I apologize in advance. Please listen to the webinar anyways. Um, but, guys, thank you for your time. Much appreciated. Uh, I'll be in touch with both of you, obviously, uh, you know, later, you know, today, tomorrow, et cetera. And to anyone else, um, we will be sending an email out. Uh, if you have quish questions, excuse me, questions for myself, Krish, or Josh, uh, by all means, email me, uh, joe.stob at youcanco.com, and I can connect you uh, with these guys in the appropriate method to answer any questions you have. Uh, hope all is well. Take care, and have a good rest of the day. Guys, thank you very much, and we will be blank screen in about three, two, one.